hello everyone. My name is John Rinaldi, and I'm joined with Alice Park today to help visualize your path to field service excellence. We're really excited to be talking with you today because we've been working with a lot of our customers in regards to best practices in field service. And you know what? Before I supported Oracle Field Service, I actually worked in a field service organization. So I know what it's like, and I'm really looking forward to sharing our path to field service excellence with you. You know, Alice, I think we're ready to go. Let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, let's dive right in. So we heard from Rob Tarkoff earlier, and he talked about the three top priorities for CX service. So let's take a closer look at how those three priorities fit into the field service space. When it comes to a unified platform, you know, it's really about connecting that front and back office. And when everything is flowing in and out of the field service organization, connecting the front and back office is all that much more important. And when it comes to a guided experience, we're talking about ensuring that your mobile workforce has the tools that they need to troubleshoot and fix problems right the first time. And then in addition to that, ensuring that your customers are able to troubleshoot problems on their own and at the very last minute they have to to reach out to someone and call for support and then from a customer intelligence perspective it's really all about the data right field service is a massive data input and getting use of that data and understanding that data is extremely important you know we heard from chris mcgugan earlier uh you know in his session with jeff wartko and how that data really moves service and how it can help field service uh, is going to be beneficial for the entire business. So before we get started on this journey, let's take a poll. The first poll is what's standing in the way of delivering the best field service experience? Is it lack of visibility and transparency, maybe in the, maybe in the office or out in the field or to your customers? Is it lack of mobile tools for your mobile workforce? You're not giving them the tools that they need so they can really enhance that customer experience. Or is it lack of automation across business processes? Or maybe it's automation in scheduling and optimizing your mobile workforce. Or is it just limited resources and budget or something else? I'll give you a few seconds to fill that in. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at these results. You know, these are really interesting. And to be honest, I don't think I would have expected these results. We really appreciate you uh, participating in these polls. It helps us drive our business going forward. All right, so let's dive in to the uh, path to field service excellent. What's important to note here is that, um, you know, everyone is on a different path when it comes uh, to their journey in field service. And as we mentioned before, uh, we've leveraged our customers' best practices and combine that with our personal experiences to help define the field service maturity in four stages. And this model is really to help to, uh, or is really designed to help you, uh, the customer, see where you're at and see where you'd like to go. So the first stage, is inbound field service. And we've all got to start somewhere. You know, uh, this is really around manual processes and, and uh, paper forms and paper maps and things like that. And as you move on to foundational field service, you know, you're starting to see a uh, value of investing in field service management and, you know, starting to automate some of those business processes. And then when it comes to advanced field service, you're really starting to hit your stride. You're providing mobile tools for the worker. You're automating scheduling and optimization and you're really starting to see a need to ensure that integrations are really shining and, and, and communicating back and forth. And finally, the fourth stage, which is autonomous field service. This is all about ensuring that everything is running uh, at, at, at top performance. And this is where we really feel that every field service organization should strive to, to, to get to. So let's go ahead and take a look at each one of these in a bit more detail. So let's talk about inbound field service. This is the first stage in the maturity uh, journey. And you know, it's really about understanding your business processes and how to improve your overall field service organization. Uh, you know, in, the, in this stage, you're learning that you have a lot of manual processes, there is lack of di digitization, and you're leveraging paper forms, whiteboards, and things to schedule your mobile workforce. But the good news is there's hope. 
you're starting to understand that those manual processes have created a lot of inefficiencies both in the office and out in the field. And organizations should first start to digitize their processes to move beyond that stage. And Alice, I think you recently experienced inbound field service. Yep, I can share my story and I'm sure everyone can relate to something similar when it comes to inbound field service. I just moved to a new home and about a month into working remotely, my kitchen sink completely fell to the ground. These are real pictures of what I call my kitchen nightmare. And the expectation was pretty simple. It was take the cabinets out, repair the damage, then put the cabinets back in. Pretty simple, right? Well, the reality was three things. There was no transparency, no communication, and no digital at all. So these are exactly the way that the technician had left my home with all the cabinets and drawers ripped out. And the expectation was for him to come back and put the cabinets back in. Well, going back to that first point on transparency, they were not transparent at all about the entire process, what parts were actually needed, or even the possibility that they weren't able to put the cabinets back together. Now, on the second part, when they finally realized that they may not be able to do the job, they sent over a partner technician over to me. When it comes to communication, they didn't speak with each other and they certainly didn't speak with me. So they had me waiting over a week for that partner technician to arrive in my home. And he came a week after, said he'd write me a quote and I never heard from him again. He completely ghosted me and left me hanging just to tell me uh, about a week and a half later that he couldn't do it and he just wasn't sure what parts he needed. Not only was the paperwork and scheduling all manual, but there was no digital experience at all. And that meant no record of me. So whether I was talking to the dispatcher or the owner of the company, they had no idea who I was or what my situation was. So I had to keep repeating my story over and over again. And if they really knew me, they would know that I love to cook and I live in my kitchen. So this whole experience has been extremely painful. I know there are worse things that could happen, but it's been three months and I still have no kitchen, no sink. This is inbound field service story that I hope to never relive again. Now enough about me. So John, can you tell me what's the next step from here from inbound field service? Yeah, thanks Alice. And thank you for sharing that story. This is a really good example about how inbound field service and those manual process processes can really impact the customer experience. So let's move on to that next stage, which is foundational field service. In the foundational field service stage, you've leveled up and you've realized the importance of investing in a field service management solution. And you've likely leveraged bi-directional communication, so some systems are talking to each other, um, basic automated processes, and maybe some binary scheduling to, to reduce the stress of your dispatchers or schedulers. And understanding your business processes has gotten easier, easier but there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, in this stage, the basics are covered. Advancing to the next level requires a hard look at integrations and automating processes across the board. So John, you mentioned at the top of the session, one of the reasons why you live and breathe field service and are so close to the space is because you worked for a field service company, right? Tell me more about that role. Yeah, Alice, you know, it's really interesting uh, that, that you bring this up. You know, obviously before I supported uh, Oracle Field Service, I was working for a hardware repair company, and that meant repairing printers, servers, PCs, you name it. If it was electrical, we fixed it. And what was the biggest challenge for you at that time? Yeah, so the biggest challenge really was is that they had invested in an on-premise field service management solution. And if they ever wanted to upgrade, it was very costly to do so. And they only had one integration. And I'm talking about a one-way integration from their field service management solution to email. So anytime a work order was created, that information was emailed out to the mobile resource that it was assigned to. There was no automation in understanding who it was going to be assigned to. That was all manually done. And when that, that mobile resource responded to the email, there was no two-way uh, communication. So the field service management solution didn't get updated. So when they say that they received the uh, work order or that they were on their way or they had to reschedule or order parts, 
all of that had to be manually re-entered into that field service management solution. And then even, even worse was that there was no visibility, meaning that when someone said that they were on site, someone had to physically get up, walk over to a map that was taped to a whiteboard and move a magnet over to where they were. Wow. So John, if you're still there today, what would you advise them to do to get them to that next stage? Yeah, you know, Alice, it's a really great question. And knowing what I know now, and if I was able to advise them to get to that next stage, which is advanced field service, you know, I would tell them to advance in mobile tools, making sure that they give their mobile resources the right tools on a mobile device device so that they can solve problems quickly and accurately and make sure that they're that when they update that work order it's it's flowing back to the dispatchers and schedulers. Um, in addition to that, I would tell them to look into a solution that would be uh, ought, help them automate and optimize scheduling so that th there wasn't always this manual work involved in finding the right person or the right resource with the right skills to do that work. And then also invest in a, in a, in a cloud based solution so that it's easier to, to maintain and easier to make changes. Bringing in things like knowledge is very important, especially for your customers and the mobile workforce. And then also taking a hard look at those integrations to ensure that things are talking to each other. And then also get, making sure that they have a system that has real time visibility across the entire service life cycle. And, you know, if I was advising them to move on to that next stage, I would tell them to, to focus on those integrations and automation because they are second nature by now. But to get to that final stage, organizations really need to focus on that total automation, uh, optimization, and really uh, hone in on the customer experience. Alice, you know, going back to your kitchen story, you know, if your field service was in the advanced stage, I feel like your experience would have been a lot more positive and you probably have a working kitchen by now. A hundred percent. That's correct. It makes a huge difference with everything you just said from an inventory perspective, from a visibility perspective, and just being updated and aware of where I am in my process. And so it would have gone a very long way, just that jump that you just mentioned. And at this advanced stage, that's exactly what you're going to get. Um, so I don't have to tell that horror story, right? And what's interesting is that we surveyed a few hundred field service organizations during a European webinar and the majority felt they were at the advanced stage of maturity which is amazing and if you're in this stage this is a very good place to be in the field service space. John can you take us to that final level of the field service maturity model? In this stage we this is where we feel that every field service organization should strive to get to. You know, and it really means that you're using your field service side of the business to differentiate yourself from the competition and be the source of revenue for the company. And most importantly of all, enhance that overall customer experience. This means that you've leveraged what we call the autonomous technician, which means your mobile resource is leveraging all the technology that they can to help them do the job and make them experts on the spot. Whether it's collaboration, knowledge, intelligent advisor, digital assistant, where's my technician? virtual reality, augmented reality, and a whole lot more. They're gonna walk into any job and be able and feel confident knowing that they're gonna solve that problem right the first time. And also in addition to that, they've leveraged artificial intelligence and machine learning to not only automate and optimize and intelligently schedule the mobile workforce, but help you know, optimize their business processes across the board. And at this stage, automation is the expectation you're only manually intervening when absolutely necessary. And when it comes to preemptive service in this age of skyrocketing customer expectations, it is up to you, the service provider, to ensure that you're finding out that there's a problem before the customer even knows that there's a problem. And we wanna talk about real-time visibility. Well, not only can you understand at a glance what is happening throughout the entire service life cycle, but also you can, you can expose that information out to the customer as well. So there is no confusion at any point, all the way up to that last mile piece as well. And really what this comes down to is you create a white glove treatment that allows for amazing and lasting customer experiences. Alice, I think you have some customer examples to show uh, that where they've reached that pinnacle of field service maturity. Thanks, John. These are just a few examples of some of the great things our customers are doing in the field service space right now. And when I think of Foxtel, I think of all the ways that they're innovating. 
Foxtel is an Australian pay TV company who fully automated and optimized routing of their mobile workforce. Just one example of what they're doing when it comes to innovation is they turned their knowledge into a YouTube channel for their mobile workers. And this is something that was really helpful to their mobile workforce because many of them were not native English speakers, which is amazing. And I don't know about you, but when I need to learn something or fix something that I don't know how to do, I turn to YouTube and video, and that's uh, the best way for me to learn something I don't know. And because of this full automation and taking knowledge to the field, what we found is not only a cost advantage, but also efficiency and all these different uh, business benefits such as revisit rates, which means getting the job right the first time. Now, DISH is an American TV provider and another brand we believe has gone above and beyond when it comes to field service. And when you're a company like DISH with over 10,000 field service employees and over 23,000 routed appointments in each day, 23,000 a day, total optimization is mission critical. And with fully automating and a single view, these are all incredible value they were able to experience. When they first reached this autonomous level, these are the business res results that they were able to find right out of the gate. They saw a reduction of overtime by over 55% and an increase in on-time arrival by 91%. This is setting the new standard of working smarter and impressing your customer. From an overall business perspective, just the cost impact in itself is amazing, 50% and 10% of that being a reduction in miles is incredible. What's truly impactful is they were able to answer that number one question we all love to ask when it comes to field service, which is, where's my tech? <laughs> and they were able to do that for their customers in real time. And because they are in this autonomous field service stage today, they were able to quickly expand into new lines of business, like appliances and smart home services, and their new 5G initiative. Now it's time for us to hear more about you in this next poll. Thanks, Alice. Those are some great examples. Now this should come as no surprise. We would like to hear from you. Where do you think you fall in the field service maturity? Is it inbound field service? Foundational field service? Advanced field service? Autonomous field service? Or I don't know. And we'll give you a few seconds to fill that in. Okay, great. You know, Alice, I love polls like this because it shows that a lot of our customers and the greater field service ecosystem is thinking about how they can leverage field service to differentiate their business. So let's go ahead and move on. One important thing to note, if you're listening today and you found this information useful and you'd like to participate in your own field service maturity assessment, I would encourage anyone listening to reach out to their respective Oracle representative and have them guide you through this. It's a lot of fun. And it's a great way to see where you're at and see where you're going. Alice, I think we're done here. Thank you so much for joining me to talk through that path to field service excellence. Of course, if there are any questions after today's session, just reach out to this email address that you see here. Thank you so much for your time today. And for the next part of the summit, I'm happy to introduce to you Lisa Joy Rosner, SVP of Brand Digital at Oracle, who will be leading our customer spotlight panel today. On the panel will be Jeff Warko, VP of Product Management at Oracle, but will be acting as a field service evangelist. And our guest of honor will be Pradeep Atluri, Vice President of Information Technology at Badger Daylighting. You heard Rob Tarkoff talk in great detail about Badger Daylighting today. And I'm really excited to, talk to, to hear them talk about their path to the cloud and the key role that field service plays in their overall business. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you, John and Allison. Hello, everyone. We're in for a treat today. We have Pradeep Atluri of Badger Daylighting, who's gonna be sharing an incredible digital transformation story with us. They implemented ERP, CRM, and field service in under two years. We're gonna dig in and learn more about it. We're also joined by Jeff Wortko from Oracle, who's gonna chime in and share some insights directly from the voice of Oracle. So why don't we dive in? Pradeep, 
Tell us a little bit about your business. I'm not sure everyone here knows what a hydrovac truck is, although once you tell us about it, I'm sure we'll all remember having seen them. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Badgers is headquartered in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We are the largest hydrovac excavation company in the North America. Uh, we are a publicly traded company in Toronto Stock Exchange with a market cap of $1 billion Canadian. Our, our vacuum trucks use integrated high pressure water and vacuum systems mounted on the truck chassis to expose buried infrastructure in a non-destructive way and prepare an area for future work. It's incredible. And, and how many service people do you have out in the field at any given time? At any given, given time, we have around 1,200 uh, plus trucks are operating. Uh, the, again, it all depends on the schedules that we have. At least we have around 800 to 900 people doing the work in the field for our customers. Fantastic. Okay, so Jeff, question for you. You've been doing field service for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Yeah, sure. So, I, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll start with a story. When I started in field service, I started to do ride-alongs with various drivers in various industries. You hop in the van, you go around, you see how they're using software and the tools that they're using. And I was working for a company called Toa Technologies, which was a big, one of the first cloud-based field service providers. I'm on my phone and I'm trying to show them like, you know, if you use the app here and you use Google Maps and everything like that. Well, we got to the situation where I'm like, well, what if you have a change in your schedule? How do you understand what you're supposed to do next? The driver pulled out one of these. Now this will confuse a lot of people out there in a younger audience. This is what we call a CB radio. What are those um, wire things? Yeah, exactly, right? Um, predate cell phones. Um, you might have seen, if, you, if you're fascinated in CBs, I highly recommend all of you check out the movie Smokey and the Bandit, free on Amazon Prime. But that was actually where field service was. And that was only 10 years ago. I mean, we're well into iPhones and smartphones at this point. It's amazing the evolution that it's gone through in such a short period of time and how we've gone from just asynchronous communication to uh, the field service rep, you know, becoming more than a rep, becoming a sales rep, becoming a voice of the brand of the customer, all the way up to what Pradeep is doing at Badger, daylighting, which is like this, every rep is its own PL, every truck is its own PL. That is an evolutionary shift that is that is out, you know, really even unprecedented in tech to go from the CV all the way to that in such a short period of time. Incredible. So Pradeep, from a field perspective, your revenue just depends on the trucks being in the field and on time. How is Oracle Field Service part of your process? Uh, as Jeff mentioned, all our revenue is straight to the truck. We call it as RPT, revenue per truck. That's our major key KPI that we measure from our success standpoint. So as I said, very important with the critical uh, from customer satisfaction standpoint and revenue standpoint, the field service is very critical to us. In fact, we dispatch around uh, 1,200 plus of our trucks, uh, all that happening out of OFS. Also our field and the team members, our operators are, and managers use OFS both on the mobile devices and as well as from PCs. As Jeff mentioned, the mobility, right? Without mobility, we'll not be able to serve our customers the way we want to serve. So we use iPhones, we use iPads to do all types of dispatching, servicing the customers, taking the signature from the customers and the acknowledgement of the work done right on the iPad so that it can integrate back to the financial systems in the back office to go get the billing and the revenue done. So it's very critical for all our operations. We call it as a backbone of our from, from business perspective. And, and how important is real time in this whole model? Very important because as we start dispatching from, from our uh, AMs and RMs standpoint, it has to be communicating directly with the operators wherever they are uh, for the next job that they have to go to or the location that they have to go to. It all should be online and synchronous so that we can generate more revenue per truck and the, and the utilization of truck as well. So it's very important to be online and communication. And that's, that's what we're doing and what, now. What I've uh, learned about 
about your business from doing research is that that service level is what really matters. And how, how does field service help you deliver on that, that quality? As I mentioned before, all our revenue is based on revenue per truck. That means to say we have to have our utilization of the trucks high and also help coordinate with the operators and the customers in a more online fashion. This a field service helps us to get achieve that by sending that communications directly to their iPads and have the information on their finger trips so that they can go serve the customer better. So that's how we operate at this point in time. As, as we evolve into the next phases of utilizing the OFS better, we are identifying the opportunities to improve and we continue to do that more in a synchronous fashion, working with both operators and customers on the field. Fantastic, thank you. So Jeff, question for you. Yes. Um, World service goes across many different industries and you know, Pradeeps is one. What trends are you seeing? Are they, are they the same? Are they different across field service and under other industries? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting as we talk to different customers who are at different stages of, of, of maturity for field service. It seems like everybody kind of universally wants to do what Badger Daylighting did and get to that point where you're managing everything as its own profit and loss. And there's a real reason for that. Field service is very expensive. You have the cost of the vehicle, the time of the driver or the technician. You have the insurance that goes with these. You have the depreciation of assets. That's when you add up these operating costs, the cost of a visit, the cost of a missed visit, the cost of you know, getting to a job site and like maybe you can't do what you were there to do. These are hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And so just even saving a few minutes can mean millions for a company. Right. So, a lot of, so a lot of them are looking at this whole thing and they're like, we got to look at this end to end. It's no longer about having a sexy mobile app. It's got to go tie in all the way to our ERP system. All the financials have to be tracked to manage this business correctly. So I see more and more companies looking at trying to take the same philosophy and cultural approach that Badger has already taken. That is a big trend in this industry right now. Amazing. So Pradeep, question for you. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, incredible digital transformation, two-year time frame, completely manual processes, move to the cloud, 98% cloud on Oracle, right? Tell me about that process. What did you go through? How did, how did you and the team make it happen? A great question, uh, Lisa. As part of the Badger's digital transformation, we embarked the journey of implementing the ERP that can help support all the business functions. It was a two years program, but we are able to successfully complete the Oracle implementation end of 20, 2019. So from, from the digitization standpoint, everybody was working a very siloed approach from all our regional managers and the area managers and the divisional managers. So we have locations across the North America and we want to bring them together from the shared service standpoint. We want to have a common processes. We want to have a common platforms. We want to avoid all the manual work that we do, including the paper and the pen and so on and so forth. So that's where the digital journey started. And then we kind of evaluated the whole slew of ERP packages that's in the market and landed on Oracle. And then it, the journey started then and then successfully completed in two years is amazing. And a lot of hard work put in place. The biggest thing is change, right? That, that's, that's what it is all about. It's a huge shift from how we used to do before versus what we are doing now. That change will never stop, right? This is the beginning of it. We are just scratching the surface of using the technology. To your point, to your uh, uh, question about 98% cloud, I was a joint Badgers, and then they're giving the tour about the uh, data center, and they open the door, and the size of the data center is smaller than my wow. bedroom closet because all we have is switches. Uh, we don't have any servers there. It's amazing, right? That's the journey that anybody would love to, to transform, and, and getting there is, is amazing. So, and we're further moving forward in that direction. Cloud first, SaaS first approach, integrated. So it's all, it's all playing well. So now we are not solving the problem about not having the um, enough memories or scaling up, not those issues. We're talking about growth here. We're talking about how we can enable more 
uh, locations. We're talking about how we can double our company in five years, how we can use the data that we collected uh, in the system so that we can make better, better different uh, decisions based on the KPIs. That's our focus, not about maintaining and managing the servers in-house. So it's a huge journey and it's already paying dividends. Now it's, it's sky is the limit for us. Wow, that's amazing that something so concrete could be light as a feather. So I have another question for you. Um, I'm, <clears throat> as a marketer, I'm a very data-driven and very KPI focused. I'm curious to know about the business goals that, that dictated this transformation and what your KPIs were and, and how you measured success. So tell me about the, the big goals and the way that you tracked your progress. As I mentioned before, uh, we are we again embarked on a journey of doubling our company in the next five years, and we have done that before once. The reason that we're able to do that is because of the big goals is about enabling the technology to make sure that we have a platform that we can leverage. So it is very important for us to, to have to support as a technology to support the business goals and the business goals, including better serving to the customers. That's our top of the pyramid. I would say top of the pyramid, but it's the inverse pyramid. We have a uh, culture of inverse pyramid where our customer stands first. That is very important for us to make sure that we get to the customer on a timely manner, get their work done, because most of them are subcontractors, because they have their own customers to serve. So uh, it is very important that there's a customer service right there. And the next thing is operators. We say the best operator, and we support the operators uh, next. And then the area and dis- divisional managers next. And the corporate is, is lower of the pyramid in the inverse pyramid. That means to say we truly believe in the philosophy of serving our operators who can serve our customers upward. So to do all that stuff, and those are the business goals and also safety is our highest priority as well. Making sure that we comply with the DOGs and so on and so forth. So, so there is a compliance issue there as well that we need to um, make sure that all our compliance is taken care. And how we can we do that? Because now every near miss that's happening is being captured right there in the iPad. And then that's feeding back to our system so that we can do the analytics on it and see how we can address those in future in a, full, in a, in a manner. So now the compliance is going to get better. So this, that's the power of systems and the data and the technology to help drive the business goals forward. It's key to our success from the business standpoint. Well, you, and you, you are just uh, about to ask you this question. You answered some of it, but with, with going from, from paper to digital, I would imagine that you're gaining new and, and interesting insights just about every day. Do you, do you have any kind of insight, even if it's just sort of the structure that, that the team is getting now as a result of, of this implementation? Uh, absolutely, right? So now... Uh, example, closing our business processes, right? Now it's, it's much easier because it's all there and we can do a daily revenue reports to the CEO, right? And then wow. see any adjustment that needs to be done from the area standpoint. So it, it's, it's all incredible power of data and the information, but we still have a long way to go being frank, right? We're just being in this journey of uh, using Oracle in last six to nine months based on which phase of the region that we rolled out, but it's it just the beginning of it, as I mentioned before, we're not even scratching the surface. The power of this data from the decision-making and analytics is going to be the huge in, in, in go-forward basis, uh, and that's what we are going to rely on. That's incredible. What CEO doesn't want a daily revenue report? That, that's amazing. So I have a question for you, Jeff. Yep. Um, there's always a catalyst for transformation. There's always a, a starting point. And, and it sounds like here for, for Badger, the catalyst was field service. Do, do you see those types of scenarios? What, what kind of catalysts do you, have you seen for, for digital transformation where, where service, field service is, is, is driving the change? Yeah, I can think of at least 15 companies off the top of my head where field service led the entire digital transformation. And there's a real logic for that reason. Field service is the last mile of CRM because that's when you're actually talking to the customer. It's the last mile of ERP 
because that's when you're actually doing the work that all the financials are going to be tied to. It really, if you're looking at all your IT business processes, they'll all end in the field service. And if you want to do a digital transformation, that's a great place to start because you can just hop the Candyland squares back and change everything. But the other thing though, too, with field services, as I mentioned before, it's expensive. And we all know that, you know, we can't like, hey, make an investment and wait for five, six years to see a payoff. No, you know, we'll all get fired for that, right? We got to start showing incremental ROI at every stage. And with field service, just little improvements can lead to great return on investment, which can be tracked and measured throughout the whole company. And that you can use as milestones to keep the rest of your digital transformation going. So it's, it's measurable. It touches everything. Um, you'll get really just little tweaks can make a big difference. And if you make huge tweaks, you make them, you can have a whole, you know, you can be the disruptor in the industry. So what a perfect place to start. Fantastic. Pradeep, do you feel like you're on Candyland? <laughs> always, right? We always feel like that, but it, it, everything comes with uh, uh, it, it, the amount of change, right? You know, sometimes too much sugar um, may not may not help you uh, all, all the way. So we need to balance that. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, next question for you. I think everyone who's listening um, would love to learn some lessons. So looking back, what lessons did you learn? What what advice can you give to our viewers from this whole experience? Great question, Lisa, again. So I've been in the ERP implementation, ERP space in the last 25 years. There's no perfect ERP implementation. There's none. Uh, that doesn't exist as of I know. But Badger's Daylight did a fantastic job in terms of getting where we want. It's a great implementation. Always there will be lessons learned, right? We wish that we know that information that we know now then, um, like ha having some kind of a the ability to see the future, nobody have it, right? Nobody has that that, that kind of a capability yet. So uh, if you know that we might have done a few things a little differently, that's always the case. But the biggest thing is organization change management, right? That's that's where I think, as, as we mentioned before, there are a lot of opportunities because we went from pen and paper, a decentralized, very entrepreneurial culture to a centralized, common business platform and common business processes. That's a huge shift, uh, both from in internal customers and as an external customers. So always um, having more organization change management training, a role-based training, so on and so forth, and repeating that. And those will really uh, help us more. And we're working on that as we speak. Uh, there's always opportunities there. I, I think that you make a really excellent point because uh, technology is only one piece and, and change involves people and humans by nature don't like change. And so we have to usher them through along with the technology. I think that's an, an excellent point. So Jeff, I have another question for you. Uh, Pradeep talked about not being able to prognosticate and see the future, but this is Oracle and our very name means that. So where do you see field service going in the next, I don't know, let's call it two to five years. Yeah. You know, I, I want to comment on some of the stuff Pradeep said, like when he was talking about the daily revenue reports and all the stuff that he's been able to generate now that he's gone through this digital transformation. If you really think about that, not only think about the efficiency of which they can run their business, but think about the agility they have now. That, you know, even small changes, daily changes in the business, they can see it, they can react to it and everything like that. And they have this infrastructure now that, can, that they can adjust and change with their business which is amazing. And so what is that going to do with field service? Field service is going to be so much more fluid. It is going to be a place for you to actually experiment and start new ventures. So Badger is going to double their business. I have no doubt that you guys, you've set that goal and you'll be, you've done it once, you'll be able to do it again. You will definitely double your business. But I would not be surprised, maybe in a couple of years, Badger is not just digging holes, they're filling them and they get into cement or they get into other forms of construction. Um, we see this all over uh, field service industries where companies that were once just doing like pay TV are now fixing your dishwasher and all sorts of stuff because they're able to spin these things up and spin them down as the market demands because they've invested in all the systems and infrastructures they need to do that. So uh, we talked about uh, field service being a catalyst for digital transformation. Now it's going to be a catalyst for full business transformation. It's 
going to be an area of entrepreneurship. And in a couple of years, we should invite Pradeep Bapp, and he's probably going to tell us all these really cool things they're doing across all of Badger now that he has this, this amazingly flexible foundation laid. For you, Pradeep, now to put on your Oracle hat and tell me where you think the company will be. I know, I know we talked about the, the revenue goals, but where do you think the technology and the business will be also two to five years from now? I think Jeff made a good point about scaling up and scaling down, right? Uh, it is very unfortunate we're in the year of 2020 where the COVID is giving a havoc to the, to the entire world. Uh, there's always, we have to scale down and, and technology uh, can help in terms of NSA scaling down, uh, how technology can help in terms, of, in terms of filling that gap when we scale down, whether that will be people or whatever it is, right? How to fill those gaps. At the same time, uh, we did not, I think that we, we scratched the surface of all the technology that we implemented from end-to-end -end standpoint. There's a huge amount of opportunities uh, to help the business uh, from both on top line and bottom line, right? We, it's not just looking at the top line growth, it's about how we can help with the automation, how, how we, are, we can come, you know, integrate these modules much better so that we can gain more efficiencies using RPAs to help with, with automation. So there's a lot of opportunities that we are looking at to using the existing platform that it can help with the bottom line growth also, not just the top line growth. So I'm very excited in the next two to three years, even we have a five-year plan, but I'm excited even two to three-year plan where the growth opportunities are humongous. The market penetration opportunities for us is a lot of market penetration opportunities. Recently, we enabled more mobile devices uh, to, the, to the teams so that they cannot, they don't need to sit in the office to do their work. Now they can go connect to Oracle from anywhere in the country, That's literally right. anywhere. Uh, we're there on 4G networks the, using cloud capabilities. They can show the customers about what their quote is going to look like, finish the sale right there in front of them and create an opportunities right there in front of them. It's, it's humongous opportunities in technology to go in front of the customer and do the business the way we want to do and grow. Well, Pradeep, I think that the Badger Daylighting is really lucky to have you, and I'm absolutely confident with you at the helm that you will meet all those goals and beyond. Pradeep, thank you so much. It was fantastic to talk to you. You're an incredible partner. Jeff, thanks for your commentary and insight, and thanks to all of you for viewing. We really appreciate it.